Hello and welcome to another episode of Marketing Cheat Codes. My name is Ed Brielt, our host, and also CMO of Aprimo. And I'm really excited today to explore, I'll call it demystify a lot of what most would think are extremely complex concepts and advanced technologies um, and some some buzzwords that we need to get into. Uh, and I'm really excited to have Joe Hilger on. Uh, Joe, you're the Chief Operating Officer at Enterprise Knowledge. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Ed, thank you for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation, and I hope I'm able to demystify some of these terms. <laughs> yes, they definitely are worthy of um, demystification, if that's even a word. I don't know. Um, but Joe, tell me a little bit about you. Um, you know, currently Chief Operating Officer of uh, Enterprise Knowledge. But tell me a little bit about your backstory. How, how did you get into sort of these advanced technologies that power uh, businesses today with knowledge management? Yeah, so so it goes back a long way, as, as do I. I'm in my 50s now. Um, probably in the early 2000s, I got into content management and portals and, and enjoyed it. And from that started looking for technologies that were not simple. Uh, you know, yeah. I remember writing SQL for a relational database felt really easy. Mm -hmm. Managing unstructured content and, and figuring that side of the world out just felt like more of a challenge. So it led me from content management to search to working with products like BarkLogic that were, uh, you know, uh, really um, no SQL databases and then on into knowledge graphs and, and kind of building through that. So I think it's been a journey of exploration and and really just chasing that which seemed hard and interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, definitely. You've got to have that curious mind. Uh, you've got to have the um, the growth mindset, I would say, to always be curious and tackle the tough problems and um, be able to get good at the tools which can um, unlock value in them. Um, so that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, quite a, um, I'll call it a, a quest. Um, so you've got backgrounds in programming. Um, I want to call it big data before it was called big data or advanced analytics. And um, yeah. really, what can I, what kind of questions can I ask the data? And then once I get, to my, get my answer, how can I go back and ask it more questions? Absolutely. And, you know, uh, we use the term knowledge management. And when Zach and I started this company, I am one of the co-founders of Enterprise Knowledge, or EK, as we call it. Um, what we what we realized is a lot of knowledge management at the time was about process and, and you know, after action reports and all these things. And we were like, you know, technology shouldn't be the driver, but it is an enabler. And mm -hmm. having the right technologies and really thinking about how can we make access to information much easier. And we use a term, getting people, getting the right people, the right information at the right time. Mm -hmm. And, and technology helps that to happen, makes that happen. So we've spent a lot of time as a company saying, yeah, knowledge management was a lot about process, but we want it to be about uh, technologies that support those processes. And, you know, uh, a, a lot of my background was with those technologies that could support it. Mm -hmm. So I, I am a COO, but I also am the CTO in many ways, which Got is it. common for small companies. Excellent. Now, um, Chief Operating Officer, I just want to put a pin in that real quick and talk about what what's a day in the life of a Chief Operating Officer? Um, how does demystify that acronym a little bit for us? Well, I'm getting closer to knowing the answer to this. And, and, and <laughs> what I mean is, you know, in, in 2013, we founded the company 10, 10, 10 years ago. Um, and Zach and I wore multiple hats. Zach, by the way, was the chief marketing officer and the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. So he was on that side of it. And I, I was, multiple hats. yes. And, and, and I was doing um, COO, chief technology officer, which is kind of the visionary CIO and a little bit of CFO. Right. And, and slowly also partner manager and slowly those have gone away. We have a CFO, we, we have a, a partner manager. Um, and so I'm getting to do more about chief operations officer. And so I'll tell you what I think it is and yeah. what, it's, what it's becoming. 
Um, it's really about looking at processes and efficiency and saying, how can we do things better? And, and really repeat good practices and get rid of it. So, so we're a consulting firm. And as such, we're always looking, how do we deliver consistently to all of our clients? And we might have 15 active clients at any one time with, with our 80 people. So there's a lot of people doing a lot of work and how do we make it easy and consistent for them yet continue to, to add value? So I do things like project check-ins across all of our work. I work with the financial reporting to make sure uh, our leaders have the ability to see how are we doing at any point in time and really looking to streamline all the processes and make sure that, that, you know, people are busy, they're doing good work, they're effective and, and that we understand what they're doing and know how to continue to improve it. So you mentioned kind of a state of continuous improvement. I think that's a big part of the job. Uh, but, but it's, it's really what's not working and how do we make it work more smoothly? I love that. And there's something about you're never done and, um, the law of incremental gains and finding one percent here and there and those adding up to, uh, big improvements. Um, so the, the job clearly is never done. Um, love to hear that. And maybe someday you'll be able to automate that, but I don't know. We're not there yet. <laughs> At least cool. chat GPT is going to solve this for me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Check that out. Um, yeah. Lots to talk about that now, but, um, so then, um, so I want to get back to knowledge management and the concept of knowledge graphs. Um, those two terms, how do they interplay? What's the, how, how do you compare and contrast uh, the two terms? How do they work together? Yeah, so I, I, I can go for hours on this, so I'll try to, I'll try to keep it a little shorter. <laughs> um, but, but I want to go back to that initial statement. How do you get the right information to the right people at the right time? And just think of large organizations, uh, you know, uh, places like Walmart, uh, you know, uh, massive insurance companies. They have all this information and it's typically in multiple systems. And, you know, tell me about my customer. What do I need to know about my customer? Or if I'm a, you know, a manufacturing for my suppliers, right? Um, the information to get to that could be in 10 different places. You've got uh, reports and data from your databases where you're running queries and, and et cetera. You've got policy documents, you've got emails, you've got uh, contact information about people, um, who knows what in the organization, all this stuff. Is, Everywhere. It, and it's every, it, that's the perfect, I like the hand motion there. Yeah. Really. You, you painted this visual. Yeah. Uh, everywhere and how do you connect mm -hmm. those and then bring speed to the questions that you want to have answered? Yeah. So, so step one, what we used to do probably 15 years ago, and we did up until pretty recently, you could use taxonomies, which were a way to put kind of categories of things. So this information, this is a subject that we care about. And here's all the, here's all the documents. Here's all the reports. Here's everything that, that addresses that topic, for example. And, and that was okay. It was actually a, a, a big leap that, that helped. At least now you could put things in piles and you could search through a smaller pile to find stuff. Um, when knowledge graphs came around, graph databases actually are, are very simple for all the talk. They, they define relationships. So uh, Joe Hilger works at Enterprise Knowledge. That's a relationship. Joe Hilger does knowledge management consulting. That's another relationship. And they call them often triple stores because they just store three pieces of information. Hmm. But so even with the simplicity, what we started to realize, and Google got it first, they started to make it the backbone of their search. Um, but that simplicity was A, the way people think, and B, a way to start to relate things together in a way that that made sense. So I don't know if you've heard the term data fabrics is kind of a hot thing in the data space. Those are actually typically driven by graph databases. But the idea is I have a thing, be it a vendor, be it an employee, and there's information about that thing that I want to know. And so a graph is very good at 
think of it as creating a map that points to where everything is in a logical fashion. So suddenly, when we say get people the right information at the right time, and you want to see all of the information about a customer or all of the information about an employee or all the information about a part that we buy that we use to manufacture something else, mm-hmm. the graph can say, here's the part and here's all the things that, that, that are associated with it. So now all of a sudden you have an, a, an automated map across all your systems and it doesn't care whether it's data, it doesn't care whether it's a document, a web page, or even you know a, a, a piece of information outside of your organization. So suddenly we have this ability through a graph to map information and, and render things back in one place. And, and that's, uh, from a knowledge management standpoint, when you can see everything about a particular topic, that's huge. Absolutely. And that's what it's about. Now, um, the, these maps, these, uh, the fabric that interweaves systems, what are some of the common system categories of systems that come together, like CRM, ERP systems, databases of different types, transactional databases, content management systems, and then uh, digital asset management? How, what, are some of, what are some of the categories of systems that get interwoven together and then um which 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 ones make sense to yeah build this map toward let's let's take an example and i think you you can go from there um we'll start with uh say you're a manufacturing organization and you've got parts right uh the product that you're selling has marketing literature that's probably in your digital asset management system. Uh, what you're selling that, you know, who you're selling that to is in your CRM. Uh, your information about that product is in your PIM. And oh, by the way, you have another system that's mapping the parts to the product. So really what you do is you take those things that are important to your organization and you say, where is the information for all of them? And, and it, it, it can be, you're here in the list. It can be almost everything. And, and picture um, if I wanted to see what do I need to know about this product that I'm selling? I've got, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching into the dam digital asset management system to get, to get documentation on, or even marketing or even just kind of marketing imagery. Right. And, and brochures. Yeah. Uh, who's buying it, right? Then I'm querying the the um, uh, probably my my uh, data lake to get some of those answers. And what else do I know about this customer? Uh, these types of customers and and what parts are a part of it? Well, then I'm I'm probably looking at my PIM, etc. So mm-hmm. what you do is you say, what is that thing that I I want to get a full picture of, and then you map back all the important elements to the source system. So. Uh, you asked a simple question, which systems? And I gave you a very roundabout answer. It could be all of them. Yeah, yeah. anywhere there's information yeah. to be connected, wherever relationships need to be made. Yeah, typically not your accounting package. I will say that's, that's yeah. <laughs> your GNL usually isn't part of this, but. Excellent. So um, there must be some, you know, folks are always thinking about here's, here's where I am today. How do you get started? How does one get started thinking about connecting these um, systems of data, systems of record, creating the relationships? Uh, What does that look like for those sort of in that emerging, developing, leading, I'll call it maturity continuum? So I I think once you've recognized... so. Three or four years ago, when we first got into knowledge graphs, we were getting calls of people saying, my boss told me I have to do a knowledge graph. I don't even know what it is. Could you help me figure it out? And and the first part of our consulting would be, let's spend a month or two figuring out what problem we could solve for you so that when we give you a knowledge graph, it's something that you can go back to your boss and say, what a success this is, right? Mm-hmm. Let's, let's, let's build something that matters. Um, now people are smarter. Uh, cause they, they've, they've started, I don't know, they've listened to the podcasts or they've, 
you know, these things have matured a little bit. So people are saying, I have this core problem. So I think the first thing is to recognize that you have a problem with information that you need to get answers to. And once you've picked that, then you can say, let's start. And, you know, the, the neat thing is, is you heard me describe uh, products and parts and I it expanded. Well, that's real easy. One of the nicest things about these graph databases is you continue to add without problems. So you don't have to get it right the first time. You can just add on to it. So what I would say is pick your problem, start mapping where the information is, decide what you absolutely need, what you don't. And, and then you can say, okay, now how am I going to bring this together? And, and then you, you go through that process. There is a design aspect of this called ontology design. And uh, so we, we have 23 ontologists, I think more than almost anyone in the country, because uh, we were early to this. Um, uh, is this for the, this is- These are the designers, yeah. yeah. Um, you need one of those. Yeah. So I, th this may sound self-serving, but don't go try to build this without an ontologist. It's like in the old days when people would try to build these big complex databases and they didn't have, uh, you know, a data, data architect that knew what they were doing. So um, uh, figure out your problem, start to map where the data is, make sure you've got quality there, and then work with an ontologist and a firm that knows what they're doing to help start to plan and design this. Ontologist, that sounds medical almost. Yeah. Um, and who, if you're doing something this significantly impactful, why do surgery on yourself? Get a proper ontologist on staff and uh, trust the professionals um, for sure. Well, and, and even more than that, even if you think you can do it, there's a lot of politics in this place. So, you know, oh, right. one of the things we're doing is we're breaking down organizational uh, boundaries that people are uncomfortable with. And so if let's say marketing is driving this need to access information, um, you're the chief marketing officer, so you probably can get a lot done. But if someone working for you, particularly at a large organization, says, hey, sales, I need this information to get my perfect picture. That, that doesn't always, you know, you, you get the power plays. Uh, yeah. An outsider can say, oh, no, this is how it's done. We're experts and you do have to share and you'll gain from this, too. So so I think it's not just about doing it right. It's about having an independent party supporting it. That's cool. So there's some marriage counseling and there's some therapy involved. <laughs> I, I, I think that's always been a part of consulting. And I, yeah. I you know. When we talk about knowledge management consulting, our ultimate goal is to break down all your boundaries. Yeah. And that is at times very uncomfortable to to uh, uh, organizations where, you know, no, this is ours. This is our information. This is what we do. So, uh, yeah. So um, I want to hit on that a little bit. Redact as you need, but I would love to hear some like outlier stories of change. Um I know you've, you've traveled the globe, uh, you've worked with organizations all over the world. What are some of those like stories from the road that that you'll always remember that maybe, you know, you're having a conversation and you're talking about this one time, like what are some of those stories that you always remember um, that you want to share? So I, I've got one when it came to sharing uh, this is with uh, uh, one of the big four accounting firms. I think that's they're big four right now, right? That's, that's yeah. That's, I, absolutely. When I started, they were big six. So. Big six, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think that that's gone down. And um, it was a really hard culture because mm -hmm. you have these hard charging people who, by having knowledge or, or having the perception of being very knowledgeable, it made them more important. So there, there were two aspects. Is that Pardon? called reference? It's called like a reference power or something like that. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know that. I don't know that term, but I'm sure there is one. The power um, scales. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. Like authoritative power. There's, if you have the information, there's power. Yeah. So there's like a power dynamic. Yeah, I totally. I've Absolutely. Uh, and so you had two, two, two funny aspects of it. 
those a lot of those that really had the information didn't really want others to know because they'd get a lot of calls. They were just trying to do the work they were doing and they wanted to be the expert so yeah. that when, when it came time to meet for their next promotion, they could say, well, no one knows it like me. You also had a group that wanted to be there, but didn't have it. And they were very quick to say, oh, I'm an expert in this because they want someone to call them. Right. Right. And of course, that was the opposite of what you wanted. Um, so when we were working with them, <laughs> there were, there were, there were some where we just said, uh, um, you know, we, we had, we, it, this was a top down, we had to go to the executives. And one of the things we started to do is we started to look at the activities people were doing and use that to measure effectiveness because we couldn't say, mark yourself as an expert because the ones that said they were, weren't. Yeah. The ones that were, were never going to tell anyone except when it came time for a raise. Mm-hmm. And, and so we, we, we had to come up with some, some ways to encourage people to share uh, those that had it. And we had to cut off. Not everyone got to say they weren't an expert in something. Like, yeah, that was. Said, there's some cheat codes coming up here that you're about to drop on how to, how to get that information out. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we did is we created uh, collaborative communities where people could ask for help and an answer and made it a safe space. And then we mined that to see who was answering the most questions, what were they doing, et cetera. It, it reminds me of one other project. This I can name names and it's kind of a fun one. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, we, we did this big learning community for all of the National Park Service. Awesome. And yeah. uh, we had 450 people authoring content and information to train and, and share with each other. And it was all levels. It wasn't just classes. It was, let me post what I know. Um, what people don't realize is uh, the National Park Service is a lot more than just parks. Uh, in New England, there was a, a person who was an expert in 18th century stone masonry. And this wow. person was convinced they were the only expert in 18th century stone masonry in the Park Service. And everyone went to him on the East Coast. Uh, and uh, you needed it because think about all those places like Monticello, uh, all these mm-hmm. different places for which you needed to be able to, to, to fix uh, the, the buildings. Well, there was a, a dialogue in one of the forums that we had created. And this person found out that there was their peer, also an expert in this, on the West Coast. And the two of them were the, were the experts in their, their areas. Yeah. They didn't know each other existed. And Park Service is a different culture than what I was describing earlier. Mm-hmm. They were thrilled. They were like, oh, my gosh, I've met someone that actually knows what I'm talking about. And mm-hmm. it's not just me. So we we ended up creating friends and and kind of opening up to others that, that we had these two experts on opposite sides of the country that no one knew about. That's awesome. Yeah, it was fun. The um that you know, that idea of knowledge then how how do you you've got these experts, they're in you know, small quantities, they're on I'll call it polar ends of uh, North America. How do you get the knowledge? For, how do you get them to share information in terms of um, making it more broadly accessible? Um, yeah, then- it it's a challenge. Um, and one of the things you have to be kind of respectful of is uh, people will not, if you just add an extra step and say, hey, you've done your job, now you've got to go share your information. I can pretty mm-hmm. much guarantee uh, that'll happen for about a month and then it will stop. Yeah. So um, we spend a lot of time looking at processes and say, oh, here's this process where someone does something. Can we capture information about that process? Or can we add a simple step that feels natural that will allow us to collect information that we can then use to, to um help others and, and, and get information out there. Um, and then at the same time, can we create a reward system? And it's not monetary. It's mm-hmm. 
oh, because I contributed here, someone else got help. I know when I go to this place, I get help too because people use it. So uh, creating the reward systems and aligning with the processes are how you really make this work. And too many people are so fixated on, hey, let's let's drop this system in and get this application in place and yeah. miss the key part of how are we going to get information out of this or how are we going to take advantage of it? So so that's that's a big part of making sure that that information is at least collected. And it's amazing how much stuff people, how much information you can derive from things people do. It can be as simple as um, I work on projects. My time and billing system tells me which projects I worked on. In another database, I know what that project was about. If I've worked on three projects that have these types of skills for these types of industries, then I probably have some knowledge of that skill in that industry. And I can start to collectively identify that this person is knowledgeable in these spaces. Um, and we haven't asked them a single question. Wow. Love that. Um, there's an art form there. There's, there's art and science to, uh, to everything you just talked about right now. Um, and I want to ask you about something that uh, kind of blew my, well, definitely blew my mind and we're calling this the brain story. Oh yeah. How does, yeah, talk to me about brain AI, this brain story um, that, uh, that was created and had some pretty cool utility for sure. But um Let's have that be the last thing that we demystify and unpack. I got to hear the brain story. Okay. Yes, this is everyone's favorite. In fact, I'm about to write a blog post on some of our favorite systems and this okay. the, the brain will come up. Um, so, and, and this is public, so it's kind of fun to be able to share this. I can I can talk about our client and everything because they've, they've presented on it. Oh, wow. uh, so so our, our client was Inter-American Development Bank. Inter-American Development Bank is much like the World Bank, only they focus on Central and South America. And their goal is to fund and manage projects that help advance Central and South American countries, right? So they might create a solar farm and they'll help put money to it and then get a return on it. And, or they might help build bridges that help really change, change the tenor of, of that, um, that country or, or really uh, bring them to a better place. So really altruistic, really positive. And they, as you would expect, they're organized with country experts and uh, oh, what do they call the term? It's, it's experts in, in the different types of problems they solve, right? So there's experts in bridge building, experts in, mm -hmm. in solar, yeah. um, uh, et cetera. And you know about that, but those country experts and those, those, uh, uh, sector experts will um, also move from place to place over time. So you can't just hope you know about them. What they were finding is um, their people were walking into meetings and starting off a meeting often with the country people, like with, with the actual country, you know, the, the end client in, in its place, and they wouldn't know about the latest piece of news. So it was the kind of thing if they had searched the systems at IDB, they would hear, oh, this is, you know, this country has just done this and this, this affects it. Or we've got some new advancements in, in solar that we did in a nearby country that we could apply here. They didn't know what they didn't know. And uh, uh, our, what became our eventual client was she was very smart. She said, I want to push people information that they used to search for. So she came to us and she said, I want to build a semantic hub. Um, what that is, is it was a knowledge graph that mapped people to their, to what, to the type of work they did, just as we described. It mapped, uh, documents and news and information from eight different systems to categories, to, to sectors, to countries and et cetera. And then this gave us a way to do what was really AI, um, and you would ask the, the semantic hub something that could give back. This is what I know about that subject or topic. And the, the first task was when someone was going to a meeting, they wanted something, a system that would read the, the meeting invite and see the people that were in the meeting 
and say, wow. based on this invite and these people, you should pre-read this information. To get the full context of the audience members. Yeah. Or, or what's the latest news that you need yeah. to be aware of? Um, and so what we, what we realized is we were going to do it for any big meeting, but then people said, oh, no, I, I don't want to you know, I, I don't want someone reading all my messages. So uh, it became called the brain and you would invite the brain to your meeting as another meeting attendee. You know, we'd interact. With. And what that meant is the brain never showed up, but before your meeting happened, you'd get a, a an email that said, here's some reading you should, or some things and some reading you should be aware of before you go into that meeting. So we were proactively warning them. And that was step one of the, of the brain. Huge success. Love was, that. Yeah. And then, then, we, then they said, well, what more can we do? And they said, well, we should sign people up for this. So, you know, you sign up for a newsletter and you check your interests. Oh, yeah. That Preference. wouldn't work. Because the reality is, is, you know, you're doing solar one day, you're doing wind power the next, and you're doing bridges the next. So the system would learn what people cared about, and then send you things that were relevant to what you were doing currently. So that became a cool thing. And then they said, oh, wait, we need to do more. And they said, um, well, we have people that jump on these projects and we can train them about the project, but there's always new news. Mm -hmm. Well, when you join the project, the brain would say, this is the project. Go tell this person all the latest things they should know automatically they were up to speed wow. you know, from the day it started. And then they said, well, wow, could we do more with this? Well, the brain could recommend other things to look at. So we created a little widget you drop on a website and it would read the page and it would say, oh, here's three other things that are relevant to this that you should see. So, so this one little really was a recommendation engine that, that worked mm -hmm. um, suddenly powered like eight different things. And our client went to their management after we had rolled out about five of them. And the leadership said, this is the most forward thinking system we've ever done. And if you want to know, does it work? It's been in production for over three years now. Wow. And still there, they actually reached out to us to add another little thing about helping advance their search with it. So, so the brain's uh, not only real, uh, it's it's been working for a long time and and working to the point where they're still willing to invest in it, and I think that says a lot about a system. Absolutely, yeah the the durability, the endurance, the um, the lifespan. Um, love that. That there's a lot of real utility in that. Yeah, and, and there's something when it comes to AI. This is a, a strong point. Um, you're hearing about ChatGPT, and there's some neat stuff there, but uh, there's two camps in the AI space for people that are really into it. One camp is, is black box machine learning, which is we're going to feed this system a whole bunch of stuff and it's going to figure out what the right answers are. And it's going to give us AI to do that. Um, the other side is um, what we call explainable AI, which is we're going to create something that has formulas that allow us to, to create expectations of things and algorithms that we can tweak. Um, and what we've found is the graphs tend to be on the explainable AI front. Um, the, the ML AI, the ma machine learning based artificial intelligence mm -hmm. is a great demo, but the second something goes wrong and you don't get the answer you want, you can't fix it. On the other side of the train, if you do explainable AI, if you get an answer and it's, it's not quite what you want, you can say, well, maybe our algorithm's wrong. Let's play with that. And that little piece is, I, I apologize, I know you didn't ask this, but it's just so important to anyone going yeah. down that AI path. I, I really don't want to skip that. Yeah, I think that the black box example is the scariest. It's like more the, the terrifying AI because you can't get in. You can't you know, make the improvements. It's not, um, there's nothing sort of tangible there to go and address. And, and some of that works really well at the scale of the web. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but there's no company I've seen that has enough current content that's meaningful and not mistake ridden to which they can count on a system reading it and getting all the right answers. Yeah. 
So to me, explainable AI, at least at this phase of the game, is is the way companies should be focused on building their AI answers. Got it. More practical applications to realistic sources of content and data drive meaningful uh, artificial intelligence. Absolutely. Joe, that was awesome. Like you demystified a bunch of terms. Um, love the story. Um, uh, yeah, like we we hold on to knowledge. Um, it's hard to extract it from people. Um, knowledge absolutely is power. Um, and but there's so much power in being able to connect it, and I'll call it the the cycle time of getting to that information um, is um, is a like a superpower. I love that. Um, you mentioned you have a, a podcast too. Where can folks get more of this good uh, information from um, that you're putting out there? So, so two places. Um, uh, one, in the spirit of knowledge management, we have a um, at enterprise-knowledge.com. We have a knowledge base, and we have over 500 blog posts, and they're frankly everything we learn we put out there. So if if someone you know people are saying. I love Some that. of our people have said, you know, oh my gosh, you're giving away the secrets. Well, Get away. Yeah. <laughs> if, if someone wants to read it all, they can. I guess number two, Zach and I did put together a book on this. Um, we wrote it last year. It is it is admittedly a 300 page tome, uh, but it was published by Springer Publishing. It's it's real. I know a number of universities are going to be uh, using it as a textbook. But again, everything we talk about is in there. Um, and then lastly, we do have our, our own podcast, which is um, called Knowledge Cast. It is, um, uh, I forget the rating thing, you may know this, but we are the number one knowledge management podcast for two years running. Awesome. Uh, uh, and again, I don't, I don't know who rates that, it's, it's, but, but, it, but we did get that score. And um, there's, there's two parts of it. One is Zach does interviews with... <clears throat> knowledge management leaders all over the, the, the world in organizations to help, uh, you know, talk about um, what they're doing well, et cetera, and do sharing that way. And then separately, I do it with different uh, software products because, you mm -hmm. know, demystifying what is a digital asset management system? What is a search engine? How do they work? Uh, letting vendors talk about it uh, the way they want to. Right, letting them say this is why my system is the best is is as big a service as we can give to our customers who are saying, "How am I going to learn about? You know, I need a digital asset management system. I need a search engine. I need a knowledge graph. How, how, who do I call and what do why why would I listen to these vendors? So we pick some of our favorites and put them on there. So um, I'm actually hoping we can get yourself or someone else on our podcast. Sure, uh, to talk yeah. about uh, to talk about a primo. Excellent. That's awesome. We're going to have to put everything, uh, links to everything you mentioned in show notes here in uh, post production and uh, just keep the knowledge party going. And um, Joe, I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the show today. And uh, we'll keep the conversation going um, when this thing gets uh, published. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Ed. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate you letting me babble on. Absolutely.